So welcome everyone. My name is Tego Bure, a graduate intern with the University of Illinois Chicago. And today we are excited to dive into the Knowledge and Understanding webinar series, which will cover invasive plant management on right away. Today's webinar will highlight the importance of controlling invasive plants and offer an overview of available resources for right-of-way land managers in relation to invasive plant management. Following today's webinar, we plan to host specialized roundtables that delve into specific topics and geographies driven by your interest and feedback. Our main objectives for this webinar are to highlight the current groundwork related to invasive plant management and we aim to showcase the extensive work being done to combat invasive plant species on right away. We also aim to facilitate discussions about current and future underground invasive plant management in right away and promote knowledge sharing, collaboration, and other practical approaches to this topic. Joined with me here is Caroline Hernandez, also with the University of Illinois Chicago. And we'd like to extend a special thanks to our co-host, Ashley Bennett, at the Electric Power Research Institute and Toby Chu, a Southern company who supported the webinar planning. So just a few housekeeping items. As a reminder, please keep your mics muted and video off, except during the Q&A session. If you can, could you please update your Zoom name to include your organization? And you can do this by hovering over your name and clicking the three dots on the top right corner. If you're having any technical difficulties, please feel free to contact Caroline Hernandez via the chat box. For any questions or comments you might have for our speaker, we will have a Q&A session following the presentation, but you may chat the question in at any time. We are recording today's session and we will share it on the Right Away's Habitat Working Group afterwards. So for today's agenda, we will kick off with a 40 minute presentation for, from our speaker titled Invasive Plant Management to Prevent Impact on Right Away. At the end of the presentation, we will have about 10 minutes for questions and answers. We, we would like to take this opportunity to extend our appreciation to our speaker, Mark Rent, who will be delivering an engaging presentation on the management of invasive plants on right away. And to our audience, we hope you enjoy this webinar. So a quick introduction to our speaker today, Mark Rent. Mark Rent is a professor and extension read specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Rent researches and extends information and extends information about the biology and management of invasive plants. Dr. Rent has over 20 years of experience, of experience managing invasive plants throughout the United States in a wide range of habitats, including riparian zones, roadsides, floodplains, prairies, wetlands, and forests. He is also the president of the Midwest Invasive Plant Network, whose mission is to reduce the impact of invasive plants in the Midwestern US. So now I will pass it on to Dr. Rent. Thanks, Tega. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Well, it's a pleasure to talk to you all today about invasive plant management. Uh, this presentation is going to focus on a few key areas. Uh, one of the areas that I want to focus on is what the impacts of some of these invasive plants are on rights of ways uh, in the hopes to help you communicate with some of your stakeholders, communities, citizens, and so forth why managing invasive plants is important. And most of my work has been taking place on roadside, so there's going to be a roadside emphasis, but realize many of, not all of these principles and topics will apply to any right-of-way area. So similar to um, in Wisconsin, we have beautiful roadsides that are really a critical component of our ecosystem. Uh, they're really important from a safety perspective and for a, a beauty perspective. And many of our natural areas are lined with them. And as you can see, I enjoy biking on many of our rights of ways and enjoying the outdoors uh, there. Unfortunately, many of our roadsides don't look that beautiful. As you see in the upper red right left here, we see uh, a a roadside heavily invested by wild parsnip. You'll be hearing a lot about that. On the right, spotted knapweed. 
And below, while this picture looks great, these yellow patches here are all patches of leafy spurge that are dominating the landscape. So we have our fair share of invasive plants present on our roadsides. And really, uh, invasive plants on rights of way and roadsides are, are really not that surprising because they're highly susceptible to invasion. Often these rights of ways are frequently disturbed by traffic or some type of utility or use. Um, there's often, especially with the case of roadsides, there's some sort of propagule spread because of equipment or vehicles that are spreading along the roadside. And probably the biggest challenge, and in my opinion, the biggest reason why we have invasive plants on these areas is that we have a lot of neighbors who own property and we can do the best job we can on our properties in these rights of ways and roadsides, but still they may not be managing them. So we're constantly getting an influx, influx of these invasive plants from our neighbors. So what I would like to do to you today is really, I, I kind of have three main goals. I wanna simply talk about the definitions of invasive species and their impacts and highlight some impactful invasive plant groups. At the end of the presentation, you'll be able to pick which ones you're most interested in. So stick around for that survey. We're gonna then talk about how we manage them and some of the approaches and some resources available. And we'll kind of finish up talking about a case study in Wisconsin that highlights how you can maybe improve some of your management and success. So first I wanna talk about what is an invasive species? And there's lots of definitions, but the two key points I wanna emphasize is an invasive species is a species that's not native to your area. We have many native species that are weedy and troublesome, but we can't call them invasive because they're native to our area. And then these species, and this could be, we're gonna focus on plants, but they could be animals, insects, whatever, are capable or are actually causing some harm. And that harm can be environmental harm, uh, such as a plant that's increasing soil erosion. It could be an economic harm, such as water hemp or palmer, causing increased costs of management in an agricultural environment if those plants are non-native there. And we can even have harm to our human health. This is wild parsnip, which the sap can cause bad burns on your skin. Uh, we have other ones that can cause some other type of harm. So those are the two key points that we need to remember when we're defining an invasive species. And because of these impacts, there's laws that regulate these invasive plants. And the goal of these is to prevent these impacts from even occurring. We have federal laws, state laws, and even local laws or ordinances uh, with invasive species and particularly invasive plants most of the laws are at the state level. And so you need to look at your state to understand the specific and nuances of what those state laws can be. Uh, so giving a national presentation like this, it's difficult to talk about what those state laws are. And it can be very confusing because each state does it quite differently. The good news is if you're in the Midwest, the uh, Midwest Invasive Plant Network has summarized what all those laws are and put them on their websites so that you can better understand those. And probably some of you are working in multiple states. So then it becomes very confusing because species X may be regulated in one state and not in the other. So I encourage you to step one, understand what the laws are that you're working with and the nuances. And it can be challenging. So I do, um, do spend some time trying to understand that. So what are some common and invasive invasive plants on rights of ways? Well, I've kind of put them into categories. I think in the in many areas we deal with these perennial grasses or monocots. Uh, in many parts of the U.S., Phragmites is enemy number one, as it is in the upper Midwest, and it's a large problem, as you can see in the upper right-hand side. It grows along many of our rights of ways and causes all sorts of problems. In the South, Kogan grass is very similar to, uh, uh, very problematic. Another very problematic uh, species or group of species are the perennial knotweeds, Japanese knotweeds, bohemian and giant knotweed as well can really cause problems on many of our roadsides, particularly in the Northeastern part of the United States. 
And then all of us deal with woody shrubs and trees, such as buckthorn, salt cedar, privets, the list goes on and on and on, which really impact uh, most of our rights of ways. Out in the West, you're dealing with annual grasses that can cause concerns with fire and other issues like cheatgrass and bentonata. And then many areas have toxic plants like wild parsnip, giant hogweed, poison hemlock that they're dealing with as well. And again, at the end of this presentation, you'll be able to kind of give your vote on which species you want to learn more about in a future webinar. So stay tuned for that. And the challenge with uh, giving a national webinar and giving management recommendations for different regions is the distribution of all of these species is not uniform across the U.S. So one species isn't going to is going to be a problem in some areas and not in others. So we really need to rely on local information to better understand this. And this graph really highlights this difference. On the left, you see the distribution of Phragmites. You can see we have a lot of it in the in the north, in the northeast, and in the west, but we don't have very much in the central states and, and in the south. In contrast, Kogan grass, we have a lots of in the south, but we don't have any elsewhere too. And so really this common theme is you'll you'll get is that management activities need to be addressed on individual species and their distribution varies across the region. So my recommendations in Wisconsin may or may not work in the state or region you're in. So remember that and, and really look for that local information will be the best source for you. And, you know, these invasive plants are highly impactful in invaded lands and rights of ways. And I think all of you working on rights of way believe that these invasive plants impact other vegetation that's growing alongside with them. That's an easy thing to convince yourselves of and to convince your stakeholders of. And again, here's Bohemian knotweed growing along a roadside. If we were to cut this all down, there's nothing growing underneath it. So it's excluding all other vegetation in that system. But often what we don't realize is there are other impacts of these invasive plants beyond this vegetation. And these are ones often that our stakeholders care about a lot more. And so I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about these other impacts to wildlife, to water, soil, and even to us as citizens or community members because uh, a lot of times those are the ones that will shift the opinions of why we need to manage these to begin with, which is often the challenge. So specifically to roads or rights of ways, I kind of have put it into four buckets that I think like to think about. Uh, and I'll talk about each of these buckets separately. Uh, we can have impacts to human health, our infrastructure, our desirable vegetation, and then these are also sources for spread to other areas. So invasive plants and human health. This is one that we get a lot of traction with in the upper Midwest. We have some big problems with invasive plants and human health. And generally a lot of community members are very receptive to this reason and don't think about this. We have lots of toxic plants on our rights of ways. Things like poison hemlock, which you see in the left and wild parsnip on the right. We also, there are also our populations of giant hogweed I think wild parsnip for us has been really effective because the sap gets on your skin and it's exposed to sunlight, you can get a really bad burn. So nobody likes this plant. It's an impact for people like you working on rights of ways and our first responders. And we've gotten a lot of traction trying to say, why are you controlling this plant? Because it's a risk to you. Uh, we get a lot of um, positive feedback about that and that'll be our um, case study I'll talk about. But we also have a series of plants that are known to spread diseases that humans can get. And I use the example of Japanese barberry and many of our bush honeysuckle species. We have several in the Midwest that are good examples of this. And when I'm talking about Japanese barberry, as you see right here, yes, it's that one that's probably planted in your yard or at your gas station. It invades forests, and our forests in the Northeast and Midwest often look like this, which are almost monocultures of this plant. So it's highly invasive. And this plant, as well as the honeysuckles, are known to be good hosts for ticks. And when we have heavily infested forests and rights of ways, we can have higher incidences of ticks. 
which spread various diseases. And the diseases we're concerned about are Lyme disease, and there's another disease that causes us to have allergic reaction to red meat. Again, really good reasons and really impactful on us as humans. We often use these as justification why we're managing these invasive plants. And then we have out west, you have a lot of these annual grasses, which increase fire frequency, which is a clear harm to human health. Some of our perennial grasses can be a problematic as well, too. We also have plants that can impact our infrastructure. They degrade our roads and facilities. As you see this knotweed growing along the side of the road, you may think, yeah, this is bad for the other vegetation. But if you look closely in some of these areas, you can see those knotweed roots are actually disturbing the concrete and the, and the asphalt and degrading those roadsides faster than in unvaded, non-invaded areas. So clearly an economic impact from that plant being present. Phragmites is a similar case, many of our creeping perennial invasive plants. And then we have other plants that can promote conditions for, fail, uh, for failure or other issues to infrastructure. And again, Phragmites is a great issue, as you can see in this picture. I took this from Michigan State University, where they cut this down and you can see Phragmites impacting the, the ability to hold that stormwater and runoff. It's creating flooding issues. We have a lot of other issues with invasives that can be conducive to fire as well. So lots of impact to our infrastructure. And then, you know, it's, it's clearly that this plant impacts the desirable vegetation. It can prevent the establishment or it can reduce the cover of that desired vegetation. And as a result of that, our goals of our land aren't met. This is a great example in Wisconsin where we have teasel growing on some of our roadsides. It gets dense enough. And as you can see, this teasel takes over. We don't have any grass growing in between, results in increased soil erosion, reduced water infiltration. Those are all two of the functions of having grass on a roadside. So goals aren't met because that plant's there. There's lots of interest in increasing pollinating, pollinator-friendly plants on our roadsides. And by having these invasives, they're not providing that issue. We also can have a safety and visibility issue. That's another big problem with Phragmites that we run into. Recently, we had an accident and the first responders couldn't find the car because it had gone off the road into a dense patch of Phragmites. So again, goals of our lands aren't being met because the wrong vegetation is being there. So how do we prevent all these impacts? These are pretty serious impacts. Well, the first uh, line of defense is to prevent these plants from even getting to our rights of way to begin with. And that's really what the laws and regulations that I talked about are for. We also have a lot of education and outreach that myself and others do. We also, when we see new populations, we can go out and identify them and manage them before they become widely established. EDRR, early detection and rapid response. Also really effective at preventing or minimizing that impact. And then the third approach is to manage these widespread, widespread populations and bring them down to a level that we have minimal impact or no impact at all. And these are all good techniques and approaches, but I want to remind us we're always limited by dollars. And this prevention aspect is by far the cheapest and most effective way to, uh, to get at management. Oops, excuse me. The EDRR is more expensive, but also very successful. It's really these dense populations that we really uh, want to try to get, prevent from even getting established because that takes a lot of time and energy and money. A lot of our woody invasive plants are where we're at in, in the upper Midwest with this issue. So really what I'm talking about is this invasion curve, and hopefully you've all seen this. This is time on the x-axis, and on the y-axis you have acres in fact infested, and you can also have a similar analogy to cost to control these. Realize that these, these plants get introduced early on in the process. It takes time for us to detect them, but we really don't become aware of them and really start putting money into, into managing them often until they're really large populations. And that's when it costs a lot of money. And I would argue our goal is to detect these earlier and as a result of detecting them earlier, um, we can reduce the cost and be more efficient and prevent those impacts from even occurring. And so how do we do that? We develop a plan, um, you know, an invasive plant management plan, 
Very similar, probably uh, you have integrated vegetation management plans already on your rights of way, and really it's modifying those. You've probably heard various versions of this. I'm gonna talk about a five-step approach and really thinking about how to manage these invasive plants starts with identification, figuring out how much you have, researching on effective control techniques, applying those control techniques, and then adapting your management as you have success or, or find uh, uniqueness about those sites. So we're gonna go through each of these at a time. The first step is identifying what plant species you have on the landscape. And why do you need to do that? Because management is usually species specific. And here's a great example. We have two white flowering brush to small to tree species. These can look very similar. Many of you have seen these on your landscape, but each of these species are gonna use very different management techniques to suppress them. Well, as you may or may not have guessed, it's black locust on the left and calorie pear on the right. These are managed very, very differently, but easily to get confused. So identification is very, very important as that first step. And there's lots of resources out there is the good news. There's books, there's guides, there's, there's we have fact sheets, we've got interactive websites. We also have created tons of videos with myself or others sitting in front saying, here's invasive species X, this is what you need to look at. And you're pointing at those features to help you look at those. There's even mobile apps now that are available. So I think the key is, is that you utilize these resources to help with identification. We have some great resources on my website in the Midwest. If you're not in the Midwest, I'll show you some other resources that are available. And I wanna emphasize getting an expert opinion and getting someone who knows these plants really well is also a really good resource. So engage some of those local experts in learning what those plants are. As this is a national um, presentation and webinar, I just wanted to highlight some of the resources available for plant ID. I think it's very region specific. So I'm highlighting some of these invasive plant centers throughout the region that you can go to for more information on identification. California Calypsi is a really good resource. Florida has the Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants. Uh, Georgia has the Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health. That's really more of a national website. In the Midwest, we have the Midwest Invasive Plant Network. Texas has the Texas Invasive Species Institute. New York has the New York Invasive Species Research Institute. And if you're out of the US and in Canada, Canada and Ontario have a great invasive species center. There's also many state specific resources such as state agency staff, extension such as I'm a part of, lots of invasive plant associations and herbariums. So lots of resources. I always say, if you're not sure, Google it, uh, type in the plant name uh, and, and the area of what you're at and say identification and you'll get lots of these resources as well that are available to you. So after you've done that set first step, this is often the step that people skip is they immediately go to trying to figure out how, what, how to control it. And I'd say the next step is to figure out how much of you had it and where that distribution is. And a great example are these two pictures of many of our woody invasives. We have areas where we just have a few individual shrubs, such as you see on the left. And on the right, we have these dense thickets where there's just literally thousands of plants per square per acre, if not tens of thousands. And I would argue it's really important to know what you're dealing with up front, because I'm gonna pick very different management strategies if I just have a few shrubs versus if I have a sea of shrubs to manage it too. So understanding where those, those populations are and how much you have is important. And another key step in this area too is to try to look where that population came from. Look for the source of that population. Because if you can find it and, and manage it spe specifically with these smaller infestations, you can maybe get local eradication where you don't, once you eradicate that population, you don't have to come back and manage it uh, over long periods of time. But if you never find that source, you're stuck continually in management and it's more of a maintenance phase versus a, uh, versus a management phase. And if possible, try to map it so you can understand and visualize where that distribution is. And there's lots of tools for mapping and monitoring. 
I'm just highlighting, we're working with a local municipality here, uh, trying to map their roadsides for regulated invasive plants and creating these cool maps that highlights where the species are on the roads and the, and the level of intensity of that infestation. But it doesn't need to be a really highly detailed map. We just need to know where it is so we can help better understand how we're gonna develop our management techniques. I would really emphasize, pick the option for mapping that fits your group and organization the best. You need to consider the cost of the mapping tool, the skill set, and the, do you have a permanent staff person that can manage a difficult ArcGIS platform? Or do you wanna do something very simple that you have the staff to, man to do this? And always think in line of your management goal. And this is a great example in this case, we didn't map each one to a point, we mapped to a half mile radius because the decisions of this unit is being made in half mile increments. So we didn't need to have that level of resolution. So think about how you're gonna make that map before. We could talk a whole webinar on mapping, um, but I just wanted to highlight some of the things to think about. Okay, and then after we know what our species are and how much and where they are, we're gonna look and research appropriate control tactics. And really knowing those two pieces of information is really, really important. We're gonna search for trusted sources of information. Remember when the age of the internet, so just cause something is on the internet doesn't mean it's reliable. So use trusted sources for control, rec control recommendations. When you look for control, you wanna look at effectiveness, the cost, and you want to look at the methods on how it's treated and if it aligns with the goals of your land. Uh, you also should think about, if I spray this, how is it going to impact the other plants that I want to keep there? So that's why I put this picture in. This is multiflora rose. We went and sprayed it with glyphosate or Roundup, and we sure killed that multiflora rose. But what else did we kill? All the grasses that we wanted to keep that were right alongside there. And so what grew back? a bunch of other weeds and invasive plants that we had to control later. So think about uh, the desirable plants and if we can develop a or select a tool that doesn't harm them, that'll make our lives much easier in the long term or an approach. So unfortunately in these rights of ways, we tend to have a lot less tools than we do in a lot of our natural areas and other settings. A lot of times we're restricted, particularly on roadsides to mowing, herbicides and some form of removal. And those are the common tools that we're, we're usually pulling out to management. I will argue that there are lots of other tools available that we can use. We're, we're doing research with goats, grazing. In most of our roadside areas though, there's not a lot of place to have goats and animals on the side of the road. Also, others have looked a lot of prescribed fire and other methods, again, difficult to uh, get them established on a roadside. Maybe some of the other rights away, they may be an option. Other removal techniques, steaming, also can be things that can be looked at, biocontrol. It all depends on how you can fit it into your system. So be thinking about those other tools. And I always like to remind people to think about the cost of treatments. And so I don't want to belabor this and spend a lot of time but costs can really vary. And so this is just some, some research that we did, some demonstrations in Wisconsin, looking at various costs of invasive plant treatment on roadsides. We have a lot of these are broadcast sprayed herbicides, spot treated herbicides and hand removal. And you can see we split it, the cost up into the cost of the herbicide and you can see the application costs. Without going into any detail, if we're gonna broadcast a herbicide, it was costing us between 20 and $40 per acre. Our spot treatments vary dramatically depending on if we had a lot or a little of the invasive plants, uh, anywhere from under 20 to over 80. And if we hand removed, it was 20 to over $100 an acre. So that gives you some information on the different range of techniques that you can use and the cost. But I always remind people, let's compare it. What's our typical default management method that we're using on roadsides? Mowing. Well, if we look at that cost, that's $70 or more per acre. So many of these treatments are much less than our standard default method. And so maybe we need to think about altering our approach, maybe doing a little less mowing and a more of some of these less effective herbicides to reduce the cost of management. 
Where do I find resources? Again, it's the same people that we talked about for identification. Uh, we can we can talk with these invasive plant centers, lots of information on state specific resources. And I think Google can be a really good uh, tool. If we type in the species name and control or management, there's lots of resources out there. Just make sure it's a trustworthy resource. It's backed by science. And it's not someone in their backyard that says, I tried this once and it looked like it kind of worked, so use it. And then after you apply, you research those management and you apply them, you need to monitor the results and see how effective those, those results are and adapt your management as you see fit. And this is really where the art to invasive plant management comes in. It's really easy for me to sit in my office and give recommendations, but I don't know the nuances of some of these sites that might allow for ad adaptation. So always be out there periodically managing and adapt, monitoring and adapting management. Okay, so now I wanna just briefly talk about an example of an, a successful approach that really was unique. And maybe hopefully this will give some food for thought in some of our Q and A. This is a, some interaction I had with a small town of Kinnikinick in northwestern Wisconsin outside of Minnesota. They were having an invasion of wild parsnip into their community that they wanted to do something about. The problem with this invasion was that um, people were getting injured in the burns, particularly a lot of the people working on the roadsides. And so they came up with a solution that they were just going to spray all the roads to get rid of it. Uh, every single acre of the road was going to be sprayed. And when the community learned about this, they got really concerned. And they got concerned, I would argue, for good reason. Number one, Kinnikinnick is in an area that's a uh, very diverse biological area, beautiful uh, native rivers, high quality trout habitat, lots high density of native species, lots of organic farms. And there was a lot of concern, like, it sounds like we're really not making a, a good decision here. And then and the big point a lot of the community brought up is, we don't have that much wild parsnip. Why are we spraying every inch of our roadsides when we don't have that much of it? And so there was a big backlash, which I think part of it was justified. Um, and so what happened as a result of that backlash is there was a group of volunteers met with town administrators and they decided, they said, let's come up with a plan that we can work smarter to manage this. So what they did is they decided that they would map all the wild parsnip on the roads of their towns. We worked and trained the volunteers on how to do that and provided them resources to map that. And then they agreed that they were going to hold off on managing those roadsides and they were going to base management based on the maps they, they created. And then they were going to develop some management approaches to use at different areas and then based on that develop a long-term plan. And basically both groups said, yeah, that sounds good. Let's do a pause on this and let's look and see, see how this works out. And what I had them do, which I think was really successful, I said, this sounds great. I'm willing to help you, but think about what, think about your plan, think about your objectives. So I had them answer these four questions. Why do you wanna control it? What's the short term, the long term, and how much money do you have to do this? And I think this really helped them kind of focus on what they wanted to do. So they said they want to protect the traveling public and the members of the town and be stewards of the noxious weed ordinance. So that's why they wanted to control wild parsnip. Their short-term goal was to treat these heavily infested areas um, so that they could develop a long-term plan. And then their long-term plan was to eliminate it or get it down to really low levels so that they can um, move forward with other issues. And then the hard one is, is what was the budget? They were willing to dedicate three to $4,000 a year towards this. So it was a major issue. But I think them answering those questions and agreeing it helped the communication process. So they went out and, and created this map. And without going into a lot of details, you can see red and green dots. This was where they found lots of wild parsnip. They found over 300 populations in their area. However, with those 300 populations, um, it only was present around 15 or 10% of the roads and many of the roads did not have it. So that was, again, validating what those volunteers thought. It wasn't everywhere. 
So what they did is they took that information and developed a map with different management. That had areas where they were gonna broadcast spray, areas where they were gonna spot spray, and then these little X's are where volunteers decided these areas are sensitive areas. People don't want herbicides there. There might be an organic farm or someone's property or a really diverse area with pollinators. We're going to go in and we're going to uh, we're going to remove them by hand with a sharp shovel so that we can get rid of them. They agreed upon doing this for, uh, I believe, two years and then assessing those results. So what was the initial um, success after two years? Well, they found all of the methods they used, the herbicide methods and the spot spraying and hand removal worked really well. Thanks to some input from me, we got them to really nail the mowing timing. They were mowing too late, so they were actually spreading seeds. And so that was a really big plus to limit the spread. And I think another big thing is that they started doing this management and there was one group, particularly our Wisconsin Department of Transportation that initially wasn't on board and they weren't controlling the wild parsnip on their land. They saw all the great work everyone else was doing and decided, all right, we're in too. We're going to start managing. And so they came on board to management. The other big positive is all of these management techniques, there was some concern, particularly with the herbicides, of negative environmental impacts. They didn't see any. All of the treatments looked good, were positive, and had a good response. And that was really good to validate how they move forward. So based on these results, the town staff took over all operations to manage invasive plants and the community had buy-in to said, yep, go ahead and go move forward. This all looks great. So now fast forward to, to today, five years after this had been done, I just talked with the county or the, the town manager and he says they have nearly eliminated wild parsnip. They just have one or two patches that they're currently managing. So they've essentially eliminated that from their neighborhood. So extremely successful. Their community is excited and supportive of all invasive plant management efforts. And, be, and, and because they now have all roadside organizations on board, they're really looking at expanding beyond wild parsnip to, to some of the other more widespread issues. And they're continuing this early detection efforts and targeting other invasive species. So why were they so successful? I think it comes down to a couple points. They developed a clear plan with clear objectives and goals based on data, a map. Uh, I think that was key. They had really good communication with the community. They informed them of what they were doing. They got involved in the process. They started small so the community could learn from what they were doing and understand what it was. And they scaled up to the whole area after the buy-in. And then finally, they involved all their stakeholders. They didn't just do it under a vacuum and they put pressure on stakeholders that weren't involved to get involved. And they really need those stakeholders to, to be successful long-term. Okay, I'm running short on time, so I'll just kind of sum things up. Um, invasive plants do impact rights of ways and the communities that surround them. Uh, hopefully this presentation has helped understand what some of those impacts are and helped you be able to communicate to some of your clientele and stakeholders what those impacts are and how widespread those impacts can be. We do have tools that manage invasive species. The methods and timings are species specific. So I encourage you to learn what species are on your rights of way. Uh, consult experts to get really good methods and timings and then to monitor those results and adapt it over time to get long-term results. And really what that means is you need to develop a plan. And that plan is me, will help you overcome some of those obstacles involving knowledge of, of those invasive plants, where they are and the control options. You're gonna need resources to, to, to execute this plan. And that can often be the challenging part. Some of our active research is looking at how we can reduce mowing frequency, save that cost savings, and then apply that to the additional management efforts. And then you're gonna to need to work with the public. I know that's a challenge with many of us, but getting public acceptance, especially if you're using herbicides, uh, can be really important because they can be a great advocate if you get them on your side. And hopefully my um, demonstration and case study has shown that um, uh, in this case. 
that was my last slide. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I apologize. It was very Midwestern specific with these pictures because that's where I'm from. But I have spent quite a bit of time uh, in in the Southwest, in New Mexico, as well as in California. So I'm well aware of many of theirs surrounding. So I'm happy to answer questions that you may have or refer you to resources. Uh, and then we'll take the survey at the end too. I believe we have plenty of time for questions, but thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark, for that presentation. Very, very much appreciated and very informative. So I'm going to invite Ashley Bennett from the Electric Power Research Institute to now lead us in our question session. So please feel free to chat questions or just unmute your mic. Okay, I'm seeing questions coming in through the um, chat box, but Ashley, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, <I'm> muted. <laughs> okay, I was double muted. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, can you guys hear me now? Yep, we can hear you great. Thanks. Ashley. Okay. Great. Mark, thanks for the great presentation. Um, yeah, we've got a ton of questions rolling in here. So Mark, I'll try to help you keep track of um, the chat questions. It looks like the first one we have coming in are what are the best control methods for leafy spurge, especially if you can't spray that plant? Yeah, leafy spurge is a challenge to many areas in the West, um, and it's actually becoming a, a, a big problem on our roadsides in Wisconsin. If you don't have the opportunity to um, spray herbicides for leafy spurge, I'd recommend looking into uh, releasing some of the biocontrol insects. I believe their weevils, if I'm not mistaken, have been highly successful. And I know there's been work specifically in the Southwest of releasing really high densities of these and obtaining long-term control. Um, the challenge is it takes time for them to establish I've heard reports that on roadsides, a lot of the um, biocontrol insects struggle to get established and persist, but, but I think that would be the second line, of course, that I would look into some of these biocontrol insects. And there's a ton of information from several different groups, uh, Montana in particular, Idaho have really good resources. Minnesota has been using these weevils and we've been using them in Wisconsin with, with modest results, but there's been some excellent results. North Dakota, Leafy spurge is on the decline in the acres. So it's really an effective approach. It's just gonna take longer to do that too. So that would be where I would, would be the first place that I would look. And there's a ton of resources and case studies highlighting that effectiveness. So that leads to a next question. So you, you actually had a question about um, evaluating different biological controls for invasive species. Do you have any other examples, maybe, of biological control agents being used for other invasive species? Yeah, there's there's several. Uh, there's been uh, really good success with spotted knapweed. There's several um, several insects that have. There's a root feeder and a seed head feeder. If you release them uh, together, they can be success. Our longstanding success is with purple loosestrife and the Gallaricella beetles. So those two are really effective. Salt cedar biocontrol has been effective, and there's lots of ongoing research that's going on in the area with um, biocontrol. The challenge with biocontrol that I like to remind people, uh, there, there are several issues, is it takes time for those populations to build up, and those, those populations need to build up and have their impact. So it's not a, often it's not an immediate result, it's over many years. And then you're not eradicating the population, you're just maintaining it at low levels. And a great example is our purple loosestrife in Wisconsin. We've done such a good job controlling it. We didn't have very much purple loosestrife. And so the biocontrol insects, they only feed on purple loosestrife. So their populations crashed. And guess what happened when the, the beetles crashed? We got more purple loosestrife. But then the purple loosestrife beetles came back. So they're kind of in this flux. Uh, but the good news is we're reducing that impact by having lower populations. So it's a net positive 
but there's still going to be some of that present on the landscape. It just takes time. And so please consult with some of your local experts and entomologists about, about the best way to utilize these. Some biocontrol agents are better than others. Uh, and there's a lot of active research ongoing. There's actually a summit, I think, happening sometime soon that, that an organization is having on biological control. So lots of information available for more info on biocontrol. So for some of these insect biological control agents, do you need to have special permits to be able to obtain and release those insects? Great question. Again, I believe that's a state-specific issue. Uh, these biocontrol insects, all of the ones I mentioned, are not native to the U.S. They are brought in from other countries to control these specific agents. There's been extensive testing to test that, they're, that they don't have a lot of off-target impact. Many states require that you let them know and get a permit in order to release them. I'm not familiar with many, all of the states. I do know in Wisconsin, you are required a permit. My guess is in most states you do need that, but I have a feeling not all states uh, require a permit and it may depend on the species you're wanting to introduce. You can purchase many of these online and there are private groups that do rearings. And often many times you can just go to a local nearby place that has them and do collections with permission. So uh, lots of information still to be gleaned by that, but that is an opportunity to explore and see if that's an option for you. So the next question, Mark, I'm seeing in the chat is, do you know of any examples of roadside goat grazing for, for weeds? I know of one example. That was my time in New Mexico, in Taos, New Mexico. Uh, they were, uh, there were no herbicides allowed in the city limits, I believe, or maybe it was a nearby city. And they would actually periodically go down, turn, um, shut down roads and have goats go and graze the vegetation. And we're actually doing some ongoing work with goats. Goats are really good at grazing uh, to suppress top growth of weeds and brush. And with repeated grazing, you can eliminate and dramatically change those populations. So it's a viable tool. It just takes a lot of management of those goats to make sure that it's in a safe environment and then they have to be repeated for quite some time. So in Wisconsin, in our brush studies, we're putting on, a, on average one goat or 20 to 30 goats per acre. And it costs us to rent these goats $5 per goat per day. So it can be quite expensive. That's in a forestry setting. Uh, but that's our average cost that we're doing our research on. But they are an effective tool. Uh, they need to be done in repetition because they're just disturbing the above ground growth, though. Mark, you may have said it, but how long do you let them graze for before you rotate rotate so them on and off? So it's very dependent on the region. So in Wisconsin, with our brush, what we're doing is we're grazing the goats until they defoliate and eat all of the foliage on our brush. And then we rotate and move them to another, another area. And we do that. And then we let those shrubs re-sprout and then we graze them again. So in Wisconsin, we get two grazing events per year. Um, and that costs per acre around a thousand bucks was what we estimated the cost with managing the goats and everything else. Now in different areas, you may have uh, easier access to goats. It may be less expensive or other issues. Fencing may be easier, but that's how we're doing it. It really depends on uh, how much food they have to eat. If there's not a lot of food in maybe some of the areas out west, you could probably do that grazing a lot more rapidly and get better success. But that's our experience, but we're focusing ours on woody brush. I think those costs could potentially be highly different in other systems and areas. Yeah, I'm sorry, I have one more question for you. And this is a selfish question because we're, we're thinking about doing some goat grazing on some utility right of ways. Yep. Are you doing any like post feeding after your goats like come through um, and knock back those invasive species? Or are you just kind of letting hopefully the, that native vegetation that's in your forest community hopefully just come back naturally? So we actually have two different studies. One is a silva pasture. So we're seeding forage grasses in afterwards. And then the other study is a natural area and we're just hoping for natural regeneration. I think you could do either. It depends on what your base um, 
what your, your base vegetation is. And they are selective browsers, so they do have preferences. And so I, I would argue, do some grazing, evaluate what they don't graze and what looks to be dominating. If you're happy with that vegetation, then great, don't do any reseeding. And if you're not happy, then yeah, you, you should supplement it too. Most of these cases, you'll probably benefit from some supplementation. supplementation. So it looks like the next question in the chat was recommendations for how you can recruit more volunteers. So it sounds like in your case study, you were really successful in getting volunteers to participate in that project. Do you have any advice on how you can encourage participation and volunteerism? Yeah, I mean, that's really the challenge in, in that case. And most of our successes with volunteerism, we have a really engaged individual that just is a champion. And so in this one case study, we had a citizen that was really into this issue, was really mad that they were going to broadcast spray. So we engaged the citizen and said, all right, well, gather up some people. Let's go do some monitoring. And she did. She got like six people and they walked all the roads and we gave them the resources so that they could do that. I think what has helped us engage volunteers is we have a Wisconsin First Detectors Network that trains these volunteers and offers these volunteer opportunities. And we work closely with a lot of our partners to team up our people we train with these opportunities. And we have a lot of resources. We have smartphone apps. We've got um, you know videos. We have ID fact sheets. So I think having the infrastructure there helps but you got to have someone that's out there beating the pavement, wanting to talk to them, going to those late night meetings and getting people interested. We use a lot of master gardeners and master naturalists, and they've been really good to work with, too. So work with some of those local volunteer groups that you have if you haven't created one. But that's been our success, but it's a challenge. Friends or volunteers of parks and nearby parks is another good opportunity. So I'm just kind of going in order. So I seem, I'm seeing a lot more questions. So we're going to try to get through as many as we can. And we also need to remember to leave a, few, uh, a little bit of time at the end for the survey. So um, let's see. The next question in the chat was about seeding following the wild parsnip treatment. Did you guys do that? So we didn't because wild parsnip was was a, it was a it was growing amongst cool season grasses, which is was the desirable approach. So we didn't need to reseed in those areas. Uh, we're fortunate that we have a strong base of uh, desirable cool season grass, C3 grass vegetation in the Midwest in most places. So we didn't need to do any reseeding. Uh, and parsnip generally does not outcompete the grass uh, unless it's an extremely dense population. So that's a benefit of working with that plant too. But if we were doing teasel, yeah, we would have needed to reseed because we definitely see that displacing uh, our grass space. So the next question um, in the chat is about Scotch broom in the Pacific Northwest. Um, there's limitations of the use of pesticide to, con to, co to control this invasive species. And the question is, does mechanical or biological control work for controlling Scotch broom? Yeah, and I'm not an expert with Scotch broom, so I'm going to um... You know, I'd be happy to search some of those resources. I know Calypsi in the Pacific Northwest has some really good resources. I know they've been researching biocontrol. I'm not sure of the results. I know individual plant removal people have done with success, but if you've got a wall of it, that's the last thing. It's a nasty plant to deal with. So uh, I'm happy if they want to email me separately and there you see my email, I can search that information or give them some of that, or, or they can look directly at some of those websites. So Tega um, sent me a note in the chat that we probably should um, move to doing the survey that they have planned to get feedback on other topics going forward. I know we didn't get to everyone's question in the chat. I'm sorry, um, but we will certainly follow up with, try to follow up with everyone who had a question in the chat. And thank you for all the questions. Thank you so much for facilitating, Ashley. So, as you mentioned, we do plan to have these specialized roundtables that delve into specific topics around invasive plant management driven by your interest and feedback. 
And to ensure that we plan appropriately for this, we now invite you to participate in this short questionnaire that will help us gain deeper insight to invasive plant management challenges to your, specific to your region and the topics of interest regarding the management and planning for these invasive plant species. So Caroline is now going to put a link to in the chat now. It's a very quick survey. It should not take you more than two minutes. And we will also walk through this together. So I'm going to just share my screen for a moment. And okay, so the first question just goes over um, trying to understand the different needs by sector. We also want to know, um, we want to plan um, by region and understand the various invasive priorities. So we also ask that you indicate where you oversee this various vegetation management activities. So we would like to know if there's an overall interest in just creating a roundtable discussion about the management of particular plants or a group of related plants. And to that point, we've created a short list of some of the most well-known of the most popular invasive species across the US. And we want to know which of these are of interest to you. And if, so we ask that you pick the top three choices. And if there's a species or a plant group that's not mentioned on here, we do ask that you indicate it. Then we would also like to know if you if there's interest overall in having a discussion about a specific aspect of invasive plant management. And to the point, what we have here is we've created a list of topics and we would like you to choose the top two of highest interest. And then finally, we just ask you to elaborate on some of your selections above. And if the topic of interest that you, that you would like us to pursue, you to mention this in the survey. So very quick, two minute survey should not take very long, but we would definitely appreciate your input and your thoughts. And if you have any questions regarding the survey, please feel free to send a chat to either myself or Caroline. And I'm gonna go back to the slide. So I'm just gonna give it about a minute more for everyone to complete that survey. And then we will wrap up. And also note that if you don't have a chance to complete the survey right now, we will also um, follow up with a link. And yeah, just to wrap up, we just want to thank you all again for joining us today. And we will also send out a short, very short survey, a post attendee survey to get your thoughts and feedback on how we can improve our future webinars. And we'd also like to hear about what topics you'd be interested in hearing more about in the future. So thank you again for joining us today. We will follow up with the link to the survey about invasive plants and also a survey to our post attendee feedback. Thank you again. And we hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you all. Mark, thank you. I really enjoyed your presentation. My pleasure. Yep, everyone have a great day. Feel free to reach out to me if anyone has questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.